We are back, you are chatting with John P. Today, I'm going to be talking about some watches that are going to become collectible. Now, once again, I do not advise that you necessarily invest in watches. I don't think that watches are supposed to be investments, though. Certainly, there have been some people, if not more than a handful of people, that have done very well on their watch purchases, especially when you start getting into the upper echelon of very rare, collectible, and desirable watches, but I think that it's just interesting and fun to look at and consider which watches may be collectible in the future. And if any of these watches are on your short list, now would probably be a great time to buy them because I do think that they will become collectible. And guys, please do not forget to thumbs up, like, and subscribe. I appreciate it. And in the description below, there's a link where you can find my program where I teach you exactly how to buy, sell, and trade pre-owned watches just like we do here at Delray Watch. There have been more than a handful of people that have signed up, taken the course, and are actually generating some pretty decent income for themselves on the side as a hobbyist watch trader. So check it out in the description below. So first, a watch that I think is a no-brainer when it comes to collectible watches of the future is and are the Ralph Lauren watches. Now, some people out there are going to chuckle. I know it. People are going to say, oh, that's a fashion watch. That's not the case because the Ralph Lauren watches that I'm talking about are not the, the very old retro ones that are quartz driven or anything like that. These are very serious high-end watches, luxury watches. And this is the sporting collection predominantly, though there are some slim or dress line versions that are also very nice. But I think the sporting and uh, the sporting chronograph and the sporting world time are going to be the watches to look out for in the future. Here's the thing. These watches are all driven by JLC movements. So you have the same movements, especially in the world time, that you have in the JLC Master Geographic. So to have a watch that right now there's an example for $1,000, I think, on eBay or best offer at an auction and it's been reposted and reposted. So if you can get in at that type of level and also enjoy the watch and take that kind of bid in terms of collectability for the future, I think you can do very well for yourself. Now, for this one, why do I think that this is going to be collectible in the future? One, when you look at items and artifacts and memorabilia, including watches that become collectible, a lot of them have to do with pop culture. Now, like it or not, Ralph Lauren is one of the most iconic names in pop culture and fashion out there. Ralph Lauren is really synonymous with fashion. You cannot have a conversation about fashion without at least thinking of Ralph Lauren in the back of your head. I guess, I don't know, I'm not a fashion designer, but you get the point, you get the picture, and the picture is when you pair Ralph Lauren and that type of iconic brand and name with a watch that is quality, is high-end, is well-made, and has that JLC movement, I don't see how the watch cannot be desirable in the future. And when you consider that there's just not a lot of these floating around because honestly, people really did not buy them. And when they did, they tend to have purchased them from gray market sellers or kind of the backdoor type dealers where people were dumping these on the market at huge discounts because they did not sell too well. I think it's just the perfect storm for an ultra desirable and collectible watch. I've personally had one in my collection. I've held them before. We've had them here. We don't have them right now because there are other people out there that also see them as desirable and want to hold them long term. And another perfect example that you can compare this to is the Abercrombie Hoyer watches as well as the Orvis Hoyer watches. Now, of course, sure, you know, those watches were produced entirely by Hoyer, but what we have here is something very similar, and I think it helps us to kind of predict the desirability in the future. It may take 30, 40, 50 years for this to happen, so I don't think this is going to happen tomorrow. So for the one guy that's going to leave in the comments, Ralph Lauren watches are never going to be desirable in the next two, three years. I don't think two, three years. I think maybe 30, 40, 50 years is probably more on point, but they're great watches anyway. So I will wrap up that one. You can see that I really do believe in that number one choice right there. And next, we have the Zenith El Primero Rainbow Flyback Chronograph. Now, I absolutely love this one. And these have actually started to go up in terms of secondhand. I mean, you can only get them secondhand, but secondhand price recently. They've also started to dry up. Now, I don't know if that's a function of the desirability currently, but when you pair that with the prices kind of going up in terms of what they're posting, 
listed at, there is some evidence to lend to that fact. I think this particular watch clocking at 40 millimeters is going to be desirable in the future because of how unique the color styling is for the watch. Now it's called rainbow, but it's not necessarily for the rainbow colors. But when you pair that with the actual rainbow colors on the dial, the lower production on the watch, they didn't produce it for many, very many years with this color combination. And it's kind of quirky as well, right? When you think about very old watches, 50, 60 years old, and you think about watches that come from brands, staple brands like Zenith, interesting little things and nuances make a watch desirable and ultimately collectible. And having that interesting little colorway, something quirky, it's a lot like the Omega Speedmaster Mark 40, which many people, including myself, think that it could be collectible in the future. So this one's also 40 millimeters in size. So when we're talking about a watch that in the future, if size trends are still on par for what they are today, it's also very wearable. And in terms of collectability, some people, if not most people, love to wear their desirable watches. So the 40 millimeter size is great. Zenith is building a better brand every day. I think this is one to put on your radar and the prices are going up every day. So make sure to check this one out if you do like it. Next, this one may be a bit controversial, but let me explain myself. This is the entire Bamford partner collection. That's right, Bamford. If you're not familiar, Bamford originally started as a Rolex watch customizer. They would, you know, coat the watches in DLC or PVD and they would modify them and make them look very cool. They ultimately, well, cool depending on who you ask. I will throw that out there. Some people don't like them, the purists out there. Um, I won't tell you what I think, but let's continue in this, in this little chat here with the Bamford watches. Um, they stopped working on Rolex. You know, Rolex is really trigger happy when it comes to suing people. You see it with what they're doing with La Californienne outside of California area. I think they're based out of uh, Los Angeles or maybe San Francisco, but they're suing them for that. I did another video. And so, you know, Rolex shoots from the hip and they come after anybody that customizes watches in bulk. So I don't know if anything happened there with Bamford, but Bamford pulled back on Rolex. They double down on uh, LVMH, they went with Zenith. Now Zenith it has an official partnership and they sell customized Bamford watches. Now they do some other watch brands as well. Just recently they got into Gerard Perigo. They tiptoed in a little bit with some ladies pieces. So we'll see how that unfolds. But when we look at watch customization, I don't know that Bamford will be around forever. And that's really the premise behind this one. I think as time goes on and either the market develops or does not develop for this kind of interesting customized version of watches, the brands can really just do it themselves. You know, Bamford has some, you know, potentially or possibly proprietary coding methods for the watch pieces, but you know, chemicals are getting better every day. And for a watch brand to throw, you know, a little bit of money to, to build out the customization wing for themselves, I don't think it's that difficult. So long-term 40, 50 years from now, I don't really see there being a lot of room for companies like Bamford. So if Bamford disappears and you have these interesting collaborations that Bamford did and went through their website and there was an official partnership once upon a time, I can imagine that being an extreme extremely attractive kind of story for a potential buyer of a vintage watch in the future, kind of that nuanced little partnership that a brand or future iconic and certainly previously iconic brand had. And, you know, maybe it went by the wayside and it's just something interesting and compelling. And that's what we get when we talk about watches that are collectible or desirable. They have some compelling story or provenance behind it. And I can see if Bamford fizzles, fizzles out and disappears, this would be so collectible and someone would love to have it. And they might just really like the designs and where else can you get a design like that besides a customized watch that happened in a period of time that no longer exists. Now, next we have the Rolex 16 550, which is actually what I have on my wrist. And this is from my personal collection. So I really do put my money where my mouth is when I'm making these lists here, the 16 550. I love this and I rarely wear it anymore because I do think it's going to be desirable and collectible in the future. Now, of course it's a Rolex. It's recently turned vintage, you know, technically over 20 years is vintage, but this watch was only produced for about four years between, um, I think it was 1985 to 1989, 1985 to 1989. That's right. This watch was only produced during that short run period of time. They made it in the black dial and the white dial. It had the old movement. So the 570 had the new movement. 
And, you know, not many people bought this watch, not only because it was produced for just such a short time, also because they just preferred the GMT Master, right? The GMT Master had a bezel that rotated, so why would you get a watch that had the fixed bezel? It was a watch that was marketed to be a little bit more entry level compared to the GMT Master, so it just didn't have the purchasing kind of attraction that the watch does today uh, for other reasons. And so what we have is we do have a true shortage of the watch. And when you consider that the 16550 had a thicker bezel as well as a very nice attractive tritium dial like what I have on this one, when you would send it into service, the bezel would sometimes get swapped with the newer you know, thinner number bezels as well as a newer dial that's not tritium. And that, as we know, takes away from the value of Rolex watches and literally any watches. And so when we consider what makes a watch collectible, not only is it originality, but also scarcity and demand. So I know I just did a video about Rolex prices going down, but this is not modern. This is now vintage and vintage is a different ball game. That being said, there is still some opportunity to jump on this bandwagon. Some exist out there. The prices have really climbed up in the last two years. But if you like this model, you like the reference, look it up. You like the thicker case size compared to the 570 Explorer 2 version of this watch. Hop on now because they're going up and it's truly limited. And if, if you do it, make sure to get it in original condition because that's everything and you don't want the parts from the 570. Uh, if you have it, okay, not the biggest deal, but make sure that you pay accordingly. Next, we have the entire brand of Habring. Now, if you're not familiar, it's a brand that gets talked about increasingly more as time goes on and for justifiable reasons. Now, this is a brand where the watches truly are scarce. If you'd like to purchase one of these watches, and by the way, they only produce Richard and Maria Habring based out of Austria. They only produce about 150 pieces per year currently, and even less in the past. You actually have to reach out to them directly, send them a contact form message on their website, or there's two authorized dealers in the US, but their supply is so limited. It's, it's really a grassroots kind of brand where they communicate so well with collectors and and I think that's so important for businesses to do now and in the future. But nonetheless, they're, they produce watches that are much higher in quality and attention to detail for the price points. I mean, if you can find one of these things pre-owned, which is super difficult, but if you can find one, I mean, we're talking a few thousand dollars. And for a movement shot like this, typically, look, just, just look at the movement shot, very highly decorated, very highly refined, modified, you know, stock movements from other manufacturers for the most part, but they change things up a whole lot. They have interesting designs and configurations as well for the watch models, and they have so many different variations in their back catalog, which is very difficult to go through, by the way, because they're a, a very small family business. But the watches are super high quality, and when you consider the true scarcity going into the future, I can only see that as Richard and Maria age, the production volumes perhaps go down a little bit. Maybe they don't go the route of hiring a full staff and pumping out the numbers because the demand's also not quite there either. So I don't see them necessarily trying to hire to keep up with the demand. And so when we look at that and really take that into consideration, the, the volume's gonna be low, the watches are very high quality, and right now they're pretty good value for what it is. So going into the future, 30, 40, 50 years, when you know Richard and Maria are unfortunately no longer a going concern, this is gonna be a watch brand to look out for. And so if you can pop one of these in your collection right now, I think it is a really great choice if you're looking for a watch to kind of speculate on as a future collectible, not from a financial perspective, but just as a fun hobbyist kind of uh, thing that you can do and have a little bit of fun with. And lastly, we have Moser, H. Moser. H. Moser is once again a brand that I talk about a whole lot as well as Federico from Federico Talks Watches. He talks about them a lot, but as time goes on, more and more people are talking about them as well. So it's not just us. I can assure you, we do not have stock in Moser. We don't own part of Moser. You know, the Milan family did purchase, um, you know, the controlling stake of Moser and Edouard Milan does figurehead that company. And I think he does a great job at doing so because what he does and what they believe in is the highest quality 
and scarcity. Now, it's not scarcity in an effort to kind of control pricing, which I'm sure that it does help, but it's more of a scarcity to create a true luxury product. And that's a recurring message that they have over and over and over. So when you look at that and you translate that into their watches that are fully in-house Every single piece of the watch is in-house and very few manufacturers, even if, if, even if that movement is in-house, very few manufacturers can say that it's in-house. And when you also couple that with only a 1500 per year production run, 1500 roughly watches are produced by H. Moser today, you really do have a truly luxury experience and watch that's produced. And when we're talking about collectability, Rarity, once again, is something that is very important. And when you really just look at where H. Moser is going, they're gaining more notoriety day by day by day as more collectors are kind of pushed away from brands like Rolex. They feel like they've been treated a little bit more, uh, a little bit less like they'd like to be. And they look for alternatives in independent manufacturers like the Hobrings, like the Mosers. And that's something that I think going in the future is going to increase the popularity and the demand for Moser. The prices are going to go up and they're going to become more collectible. So what do you guys think out there? Which watches do you think are going to be future? Future collectibles, whether it's 50 years into the future or even five to 10 years in the future. I would love to see it in the comments below. Please do not forget to thumbs up, like, and subscribe. I really do appreciate it. And if you haven't caught it before, I do have another YouTube channel where I talk about business, entrepreneurship, um, a little bit of technology, some motivation, things like that, and a lot about behind the scenes of what goes on at DelrayWatch.com. Thanks, guys. You have been chatting with John P. Ciao.